application in this case is unicast. So, so that, that's a quick uh, concept overview. So Can now this- go back to that diagram just for yes, a sir. second. Yes, sir. So it doesn't really matter whether this is a wired network or a radio network or- Oh, no, it doesn't matter. So, so, the con so, so for this project, um, I intend to use only IP network just as a proof of concept. And I, I, the scope, I limit it to um, unicast. There's no broadcast. Let, let's say there, there's no local, local broadcast. But the fabric interface, basically, is a middleware between the application and the, the, the lower level um, uh, tra transmission medium. So it could be Bluetooth, it could be Wi-Fi, it could be you know, uh, DSL or XP. Or whatever. Right. It doesn't matter. So does that, does that make sense? OK. So, and it's all identical. There's no difference between the, the interface <laughs> On, on the producer side versus the, the interface on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the data consumer side. So on the scope of this project, so usually a, um, a user app will interface the fabric framework with, with the API. Either this is it's still to be decided. It's either going to be a, a remote procedure call or some sort of like a, 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 a RESTful API. So, so the fabric network will based on, basically sit on, on top of the supporting library, which I'll get to in a second. And this library uh, will be cross-platform and cross-language so that it can support a variety of OSs and, and, and different types of hardware. So whether it's a Windows server or a Linux server running on x86, powerful x86, or um, a, 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 a Debian uh, or an RTOS running on but ARM, it shouldn't matter. So um, these are a couple technologies that I, I will use. Um, the last two are still uh, to be decided, depending on how much time I got at the end of the project, or whether to implement them or not. So a uh, distributed directory service to um, keep track of um, the nodes on the network. And this, um, all of the technology mentions here will be a part of the fabric, aka they will be, they will be actually used on every single node. So um, it's th this is uh, going to be either MangoDB or uh, non a, a form of uh, non-SQL DB, like uh, the one that we, we did in the OLD class. So, um, and also a, a fabric protocol stack, which is responsible for formatting and sterilizing the messages. So I'll use Google Protocol Buffer for that particular purpose. And um, also an asynchronous message transfer library, uh, ZMQ, for, for shooting data out and managing uh, all, the, all, all the transfer aspect of the data. So I'll, I'll pick the two of these to talk about since well, we don't have too much time. So uh, actually the three. So the, the directory basically uh, keeps track of a list of nodes. So in this case, we use IP network as an illustration. Um, so, so there are two type of setups. Um, the, the, the purpose, let me just re-clarify, the purpose of the node is that um, in the event of a backlink fail failure, um, the node can still communicate with each other, but this is in the normal operation mode where everything uh, is um, acting normally. So there will be a registration server to uh, help the initial setup of the network. So uh, the, the purpose of the registration server is basically keeping track and serving out this list. And this list will be pushed to all, all, all of the nodes that is known onto the network so that all the nodes ha will have a uh, sense of uh, what's available for me to talk to uh, in a peer-to-peer in -peer fashion. So um, basically, this is a simple um, communication sequence. Uh, the node sends a hello message. So node one and two, in this case, we assume is already on the network. And the new node is just joining the network. Um, so, so the new node will send a hello message, and the server will confirm it, and send this directory, push this directory to the new node. And the new node will acknowledge it. And uh, it, during this process, it, it, will, it will let the, let the server know if there's any hidden node that the server doesn't know. So it will update up, up, up the list accordingly. So let's say in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a backlink, a backlink failure case, let's say uh, for that island example, a storm came in, that radio link going to the shore gets knocked out. Now that's, that server is not available anymore. So now all the nodes will basically um, uh, go, go to an operation, I call it a mesh operation, that might, might not be the correct word for it. So it, it's sort of the backup, backup mode, which is the point of this project, is that um, when the server is gone, now these nodes can act independently and be able to support the additional nodes. So the directory that was synced before will, 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 will be uh, sitting on, on, on a storage space, uh, space on each node, so that uh, when a new node joins, it follows a similar fashion uh, of, of a synchronization protocol, so in, so, so in such a way that every every node will know, the, uh, will, will be aware of the availability of every other node. So pretty much this is identical. Send hello message, get the confirmation from. Uh, so this is the new node, as this is the node two, it's called node one and node two. So basically, um, we'll, we'll pick an existing node. But the assumption I'm making right here is um, that one, at least one of the valid 
existing node will be provided uh, by the user uh, during, during, the, during the initialization sequence. So it sends a hello, gets a confirmation, and do it at a similar fashion. And the, for, uh, once it gets that uh, list, direct, directory list, it will work that list, uh, update every, every other node on that list on the network, so basically letting them know, hey, I'm here, I'm, I'm, I'm new, I just joined the network. So whenever um, there's a message intended for me, they, the fabric can forward, forward that message accordingly. So, um, for, but, but for node two, it's only a one-way interaction. It doesn't require acknowledgement to, uh, to uh, say fabric space. Now, the second part of this is the Google protocol buffer, which is quite nice. So um, this is a cross-platform um, uh, structured data serializer. Um, essentially, so this is just a little quick, um, like a demo protocol that I wrote. Um, basically, we can define data structures and fields in, 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 to specify how the data is being formatted in binary. So Google protocol buffer, unlike XMLs, is purely in binary. Um, so the way to use this is actually quite simple. We define a protocol in this file, compile it for, for a language, let's say, uh, C++, and this will generate the uh, C++ header files. When we include that header file, and we can call the corresponding functions as um, uh, provided by the, the, the uh, Google protocol buffer, and we can use the data structure accordingly. And then um, that, that's pretty much the serialization part taken care of. The, be uh, the best, best thing about this is uh, it support backward compatibility. In case this needs to be updated down the road, um, it will be uh, pretty easy. Just simply update this file. And, and, and we don't have to update all the existing node, right? This file, the newer version of this file will work with the older version. So, um, and, and it supports multiple languages and, and multiple platforms as well. So, and also the um, CMQ, which is the, which is the, um, it's just, I, I think about it, it's pretty much a, a socket, uh, but, but it provides a high, high performance asynchronous way of uh, communicating for uh, distributed applications. So there, there are a couple um, ways to set it up, set this up. I'm considering using ZMQ not only for the uh, transmission fabric side, but also for a uh, uh, remove procedure call for, uh, for the application to attach um, to, to, to the fabric. So there, there are a couple layouts that, that can be uh, achieved with this. So request replace typical, a typical task distribution layout for uh, RPC. So they call it service bus topology. <coughs> um, now the push subscribe is for data distribution, and it uses a distribution tree as the underlying data structure. Uh, push and pull is simply, um, I, they call it, excuse me, they call it parallelized pipeline, but I think of, I think of it as a way of a crossbar, like um, what people often use on, on, on our on ship, on bus interconnect. So um, push and pull is pretty much uh, just you stick something in from one side and come out of the other side. And socket pair is pretty much just a socket pair. So um, th th this will be a, 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 a basically a, just, to, to, just to provide a sense on how this is, will be laid out. So I'm still deciding on this part whether to use COM or uh, just a zero, a zero MQ as the uh, implementation for the uh, Fabric API for the user app to attach to. But basically, when, when the message hits um, this block, the Fabric logic will, will, will you use that to determine how to send it onto the Fabric, uh, common, a common fab, Fabric media in this case. But uh, in that case, it's unicast. And then uh, it will run that message through the protocol buffer um, to, to serialize it. And and then shoots it out through the ZMQ. The rest is handled by the uh, device driver on the OS. Uh, so milestone currently uh, layout, software library components are already decided. And the CI environment, I built it halfway through there. I run into some issue with Docker, so that's uh, put on hold. Um, I don't need it, but it's currently not done. I would love to get that working. Uh, so <coughs> on April 6th, I decided, uh, basically, I tried to shoot for get one side of the ZMQ working on the fabric. Um, I already have a cloud-based test bag running on Amazon Web Service with 10 nodes and uh, uh, running on a virtual fabric cloud, so which is a local network that I carve out on the test bag. So um, April 14, working directory with the database protocol and the code freeze on, on the protocol buffer code. And the communication logic, the app side, ZMQ, which is the, uh, the, the fabric interface for the applications. And then I'll, so, so the project is to focus on building the, the Fabric app, but there will, I'll have to build a demo app to demo the functionality of the Fabric app. So, and eventually, uh, I'd like to build a Docker image for submission. Oh, you're, you're, you're going right down to the wire. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. You know, it's an interesting idea, and, and you know, 
what you're trying to do makes a lot of sense and it's all doable. It's just that there's a lot of like to, to, a lot of to, stuff to do between now and to narrow the scope down. Uh, I got up a lot of the stuff like before there was one slide. I want to use uh, sort of like a mocap uh, election process. So when this but the, the current problem is with that distributed directory, it doesn't scale. What yeah. happens if you have two million, two million nodes? Right? Yeah. The scalability is a problem. Well, so maybe you'd like is, is a set of neighbors that... Right, so, 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 yeah. so, so the, the whole idea of that uh, uh, OSPF is to select a gateway node within a region, yeah. and then all the traffic is forwarded to the gate, gateway node. Also the, uh, um, the dynamic routing part. So, so I, I don't think I'll have time to implement that. But you know, the, I think that's a critical part for for this technology to make sense. But I still work. Super, super, and you did a real nice, efficient job. So this is this is just a final remark. It's a super exper experimental project, and right now we assume we're just running on IPv4. We're not going to involve Bluetooth or XP or anything else. And um, we assume that registration server is available at the beginning of the network. It can die afterwards, but uh, initially it will need the help of the registration establish the first node. And during failure, at least one of the valid nodes will be provided by the user so that they can. All right. Any okay. questions for Eric? Okay, terrific. Thank nice you. job. Boy, did you manage to plan well. You don't have to talk quite that fast. Uh, <laughs> right. I, I, I felt bad last time was valuable and not being able to go. So. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ji Ho, and today I'm going to present a mini project using Ethereum blockchain. So, probably you have heard about the Bitcoin. But Ethereum is actually the second largest public blockchain running in the world. Since my project is built on the Ethereum blockchain, so the blockchain I mentioned in my following speech is Ethereum blockchain. So this is ideal, and I'm currently working as a research assistant, and we did some research of the blockchain technology, and we also want to explore the possibility of the blockchain technologies, like how to use the blockchain technology for educational purposes. How to include the blockchain technology into the education routine. So the one of the ideas we come up with is to use a blockchain technology to track in the submitting record based on assumption that uh, any student who finish their own co the course project independently will have more submitting record than those uh, than those who just copy others' answer and submit it just before the ceremony. So this is a situation this project can apply. Suppose in this classroom, I've already set up a private Ethereum blockchain network. Each one of you can join this blockchain network, do some mining, and get rewards. You can look at this very interesting picture here. And I've already set up a private network. And I, I actually mined 2,369 Ether, the cryptocurrency generated by the Ethereum blockchain, which equals to millions of dollars. But according to the, but uh, how how to how to how to spend this money, like how to make this this Ether coin more meaningful and used in our classroom. So another idea is to I want to uh, build a Chaos-like community that uh, student can post can pay for ask uh, pay for asking question and. Uh, the real needs, the real one of the real needs to usage of the user is might be that you can use this user to like pay for the net net pay if you miss the deadline. So this is my project. There are basically two parts. Uh, the first part is a command application uh, used to knock some mini records of blockchain, and the other part is a web web application for floppy scoring, pay question and answer, and file browsing. So what I'm trying to do is to combine the blockchain technology with the web technology. So this is a. So do you earn? Mm -hmm. Do you earn coin by answering questions, and then you spend it asking questions? Is that the idea? 
Yeah, you, actually, you uh, you can like ask a question by the user you mind in this in this in this private blockchain network, and the, well, I don't know what mining means. So yeah, I'll you... explain it later. Okay. Yes. So this is basically the architecture of this project, and both you can see the client, both the client side and server side uh, runs on the top of the blockchain, and the client side basically runs a command line, command line tool. And the server side is typically the website combined with the blockchain. So let's talk about the my application first. So this is the technology I'm going to use to build this my application. The Go Ethereum is actually the Go long implementation of the Ethereum protocol. There are several other um, implementations like C++ implementation, Python implementation, Rust implementation. Last implementation, etc. Solinity is a program language for writing smart contract. What is smart contract? I'll talk about talk about it later. Couple is a framework for smart contract development, make it easier to test and deploy smart contract. Node.js, a JavaScript runtime built on prompt, a JavaScript engine. And in my case, I'll use uh, Node.js to build a cross cross platform command line application. NPM is a package manager for Node.js. Um, WS is a third party JavaScript Node.js library. It's a JavaScript implementation of the WebSocket protocol. This protocol enables the interactive communication between the user and the server. So technology, let's talk about the blockchain first. So what, what is blockchain? Blockchain is actually a uh, append on the knock that store transaction record for cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. It also a globally shared database, which means you can access the data by just participating into this network. So the blockchain is also a data structure. The block is actually the unit of of this of this data structure. Each block contains hash of the previous block. It also contains the uh, uh, several transaction record. The whole system is secured by a chain of cryptographic puzzle. So, uh, is it clear? So, this is a peer to peer network of the blockchain system. As you can see here, there are several nodes separated around the world. So, this is entirely a distributed and decentralized uh, system. Each node, each node run, actually runs run the same program and has the same copy of the data. And some of the nodes are warnings, and some of the nodes are miners. And each warnings will have a public key and a private key. The public key is just like the ID on your bank card, and the, the, private, the private key is the password. So each transaction is signed by this private key. So once it's done, it cannot be modified anymore. Uh, miner is responsible for do the mathematical computation, which is called mining, and uh, pack up those transactions and ex extend the, the blockchain. So when a new block is mined, it will be broadcast to every node in this network. So the typical uh, blockchain just used to store the transaction record. So what if instead of just to store the transaction re record, is it possible to uh, run up tree program or store some other information on blockchain? So, so if this functionality is enabled, you can treat the blockchain as a decentralized and secure storage system. Smart contracts actually is a code running in the blockchain. So smart contract helps you exchange money, properties, shares, etc. in a transparent way. The best way to understand smart contract is to compare it as a vending machine. Basically, you drop some coins to this machine and you get the data or other information back to your account. <coughs> so, so Sonity is a programming language to write smart contract. So here is a simple example here. It's Basically, a key value store a simple mapping, and uh, you can set the key value, and uh, you can get the value by its key. So, 
this the basically in smart contract the right operation will call, will charge you some money, and the right operation can be created. So how should it works? Personally, prefer this skin-like workflow. And uh, first, you run DSBM is the name of this command application. Uh, basically, you run DSBM init first. You uh, set up the working environment. And when you use the DSBM sub init example.js, uh, on the one hand, you actually log this files hash to the to the the smart contract residing in this residing in the blockchain, and uh, and which which will trigger a transaction. So, on the other hand, you keep the receive of this transaction and these files hash locally. And when you do the upload, you post this record file with the source code file to the remote server. So just like this, you when you do the git commit, you actually just uh, keep the changes. To keep the changes locally, and when you do the gate push, you actually push the changes to the remote server. So this is a sample of how to build a class platform, class platform command application using Node.js. This is just like a build a third party, uh, third party. Node module, uh, Node.js library. Uh, you first run npm init, and you provide the basic information about this about this uh, library. And most important is here. Uh, this thing you specify the name of this component application here, and this is and this index.js. This file is the entry of this of, of, of this command. And then this is the content of the, the, this file. Basically, just print out something, and you in, just install this this this, this tool, and you can run it. So basically, you can run this. You can run this program. Uh, you can follow this workflow. Um, Windows or Linux, it will show you the same result. <coughs> so it's web application. So this is the architecture of the web application. As you can see here, this is like a typically a typically a, a web the a web application combined with the blockchain. The blockchain here is just like another storage system. Uh, database is to to store the information generated by the website. File storage to store the file uploaded by the Students. So this is the technology I'm used to build this uh, website. Node.js again. Uh, Express is a fast, pretty much the framework for to build a website. It's a typically uh, MVC uh, framework. Bootstrap is MongoDB and NoSQL database. Bootstrap is to build the uh, uh, responsive web pages. MetaMask is a Ethereum one-in application in browser. So what is MetaMask? Uh, there are three functionalities provided by the MetaMask. Basically, you can, more, you can use this, this tool to manage the <coughs> network connections. You can select different network, which one you connected to. And uh, you can manage the identities. You can also man use this tool to manage your benefit balance. So pretty much down the web page design. So this this one is for block exploring part. This is it displays display the block information and the tra transaction information on the on this private Ethereum blockchain. Also the question and answer part. And you can see here it's uh, it's pretty much like a piazza like a web page design. And you can pay for asking this question. There's a, like a voting functionality provided here. So this is pretty much on my schedule. And uh, by March 33, I'll finish the user management course. And by the April 26, I'll 
change those functionalities above. And by May 22, they can serve helping the integration and testing part. So this, uh, could you go back to that slide? So mm -hmm. the first date you have here is March 31st, yep. June. Does that mean everything above it is done? Yeah. Is it for my all my presentation and questions? Um, are you are you making a application ex uh, specifically, or are you uh, uh, trying to make an example that you can use uh, Ethereum uh, blockchain platform to make a specific? Uh, I'm gonna build a specific. Although it really does provide a, you know, your application is broad enough so that probably you could use it as a starting point for other applications. Yeah, it looks impressive, but yeah. it's just uh, it's a lot I don't understand about yeah. it yet, but good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Zemo. You guys are doing a great job of uh, <laughs> keeping us on schedule. Professor Forsyth, may I ask how much time do I have? Do I, may I ask how much time do I have for? Uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, you can take half an hour. Okay. Uh, so that's <laughs> you'll be the third. So uh, you're the only one left, to root, right? Yeah, because I'm willing to say okay. This stuff? Okay. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jumo. So today I'm going to talk about my final project. The topic is building a resume website. Did you get what I mean? So let's review today's agenda. So I'm going to talk about the product project concept first, then list with the technologies involved, and I'm going to have a brief product preview, and with about some technology tutorials with each technology we're going to involve, and also schedules with the milestones. And feel free to ask any questions during the presentation. So the project idea. So I want to build a portfolio website, of, or rather project, to demonstrate uh, job interviews. So this is a project that you can present yourself to future employees or, uh, or, or the recruiters. So make, taking an example of a great company, so if you are making good products but you don't advertise yourself, you're having a low efficient by selling those products. But what if you have a great website that advertises yourself? People will visit and you will have partners to visit and make partnerships. So this is similar to the self-selling as well. You, are sell, you want to sell yourself in the careers, so you want to make a great resume, especially with a portfolio website. And also, when you, during the process, I want to get familiar with the open source web building technologies. This is a main technology we'll be involved and talk about in details later. And uh, I also want to practice on the user interface design. I've been involved in the past couple of years with the um, website designs, but I also want to improve. How does the UI look like better to be attracting people so that people want to visit it with your websites? But I'm getting practice on that as well. I'm hoping that at the end of the day, I will be building a good looking websites and attract more people. And uh, I want to enhance the debugging skills as well, not only uh, C Sharp, C, but also in this case, the webs with the, the web technologies. Uh, and I also want to improve the project management. Although this is only one person project, but I also divide those tasks into different steps, and I want to manage them uh, timingly. And uh, I also want to build the test cases and feedbacks. Uh, I will, um, first I will myself will build some customer <laughs> users, test users, and once the service and the database goes alive, I would like to uh, invite people to get feedbacks. And I think feedbacks is very important for especially our developers to get future products better. And the features, what the website will be features. So I think 
It will be uh, first, it's a responsive, scalable resume websites. Build that means that this is a core idea, and I also provide users with secure authentication and authorization. People can log in to make their own websites, similar to LinkedIn, but I want to explore more about it. And uh, so these are the, the next three points are the key parts for the components for the websites. I want to present user to space to display their detailed resume rather than the a regular resume you see in the job market, there's only one page plain. But rather in this website, you, you can have links, pictures, and more detail about your past experience. And uh, create rooms for users to showcase their projects. So another single separate page will be available for showing mm -hmm. their projects with pictures and also the folder directory structure like they can view the code as well, a list of projects they can view. And also, where rooms uh, allows, allow users to share their stories. Stories are particularly interesting once you want to know more about people, not only about their experience, but their past experience for the life. And uh, the, the others are the non-functional requirements. So you want to make the website to be fast and stable, and user-friendly, that's a UI mentioned before, and also accessible and maintainable. People can easily get hands on how to edit their own page and easy to maintain. It's the user friendly. That's what I'm hoping to do. And me. Why do we use me? Uh, because it's uh, one language to rule them all. Because all of them are based on JavaScript. So it's very easy to manage. And you will have a clean code with the code database. And everything as a good part, they are all open source. You can use them freely. So that's a good part. And they have been a long history, and so you have very huge module library to support them. So you don't need to actually go from scratch. Anything you can build, you can go using the modules to help you get started quickly. <coughs> That's why we're using Mean. And the technology we involve, let's do a brief introduction, or rather a summary for each of them. So Mean stands for, as an acron acronym, so for MongoDB, Express, Angular, and Node. So MongoDB is a, as we know, um, on SQL database. Express is a web application framework that runs on Node. AngularJS is a JavaScript MVC framework that are running on browser with JavaScript engines. And lastly, the Node is an execution environment, event-driven server side and network applications. So these are pretty convenient technologies. And we will go into this diagram later, but basically you will show that they are working together as a family, I'd rather say, because everything is in JavaScript. It's rather than a family production. So let's preview a little bit about my future product um, websites. So as I mentioned before, there's three parts I want to focus. A resume page, a repository page, and a store page. Uh, I'm, I'm going to view the traditional ones, which you have seen the navigation bar is on the top side and on the top left corner you will have a logo or a name and you will have three tabs going through it if it's over or a single page application and on the on the top uh, top right side you will have a user login and you can sign up as well and for example the resume page I want to focus more as I said before it's rather a more detailed version of your traditional resume. You can put more things rather than only the education skills and such items. You can write in more about it. So it's actually extendable because it's a website. You can write as much you want. And you can also have pictures. This isn't just a logo. For example, you can put pictures. Also, of course, links. If you have other things you want to link to your people perspective viewers. And next one is if you want to show your uh, past projects or the uh, things you worked on. So there is a repository page. I'm thinking about making this as a picture. This also works for the link. You can click then in queue to see the details. <coughs> and this goes into a detailed view. On the left corner, you will have a directory or the file explorer view where you can see different couple of projects. As long as you click in, you will see more detailed structure of your projects. And on the right side, it's more like a viewer, so you can see the document or the code view on the right side. 
I think it's a clear structure, structure for them to view the code, similar fashion to the Studio or other IDs. And the uh, story page is pretty straightforward. You can have a lot of stories going on. Uh, just taking these three as example, I would like to write uh, my childhood story, which are before the college. And I also have my essay story, uh, mainly focused on the mix. I also have the work story, although they are just part-time on-campus job, but I might can read more about these relationships I built along the years. So these are a very experience, good experience for me. So uh, we will talk about how they work together, uh, but I want to first talk about how they're going to do individually, then we're going to find how they work together. So. Uh, we, I'm going to start with the client, <coughs> server, and database from this order. So the AngularJS, AngularJS is working as a front end. It is open source, created and maintained by Google. Very convenient, dynamic, and pretty fast. It provides a client-side MVC framework. So in our case, we are building a single application. So it's very great for that. Although you might see different pages, but you refresh, you don't load the whole page, you only update the section. So this is also considered as a single page application. And uh, it has excellent data binding for the communications. It has clean code, very easy to test. And it has modular, the module library we mentioned before. That's, it's very maintainable and very clean. And we can compare, combine, uh, compare this with the traditional ones. On the left side is our Angular website. This the right side is the traditional ones. Uh, the, the Angular ones, they will let the browser handle the work. They will uh, get the data, such as HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and uh, load the data and make the page. They will save a lot of work, actually, <coughs> resulting in fast loading speed. So rather than on the other side, the traditional ones will let the server handle the request, loading the data, and making the page makes it very slow compared to the AngularJS one. So thanks to that, we were having a very fast, smooth, and efficient website. It's a experience very better. Uh, OK, and uh, next one, the Node. Node is a server-side JavaScript, which is the middleman working on the server side. Uh, it is synchronous and event-driven. And it is a good runtime environment for executing the JavaScript, which is the essential language we are having here. And it is running on Google Chrome V8 JavaScript engine, which is pretty convenient and perfect for data-intensive real-time applications routing those data. And it is extremely lightweight and efficient, very highly responsible and super fast, highly scalable as well. You can build from simple, but you can always add in more data later on. Scalable is very important. And it's also clean, as we mentioned before, everything is in JavaScript. It's easy to manage with a consistent code database. And it has a large ecosystem of open source library that it brings to the next component of the library. So Express, it is a node, frame, a node web framework. It creates routings and APIs to connecting those pieces, it provides minimal and flexible uh, the web application framework, which builds the very solid foundation. It also subtracts away a lot of low-level logics, such as HTTP requests. It will save a lot of time doing the requests and handling the communications. And also helps us to organize into an MVC structure. It's very nice and neat. And everything else uh, is a database. Database is where we store the data. We want to have the user data, their story resume, and repository. And we want to use MongoDB in this case. MongoDB is one of the database, non-SQL one. Uh, it's categorized as document database. And it is the currently the top non-SQL database around the world. And it is JSON-like syntax, so we can output them in JSON for the communication. And it is fast and scalable as the other members as well. And it, is, mm, increase, it will increase your productivity and employ deployment ready for those commodity servers. So that's make it very easy. And everything is open source for this one as well, running by the MongoDB itself. 
Uh, let's do some simple comparison with other non-SQLs. Why we choose MongoDB rather than the others? So for non-SQL ones, we have four types. Key value is the simplest one, where you respond in value to the keys. And while the columns, you store the data by columns. And the document database is the protagonist today was MongoDB. And also the graphic database, which is ideal for networking data. And MongoDB, the reason why is that MongoDB leads a pack of non-SQL database, and almost one third of the 1400s choose MongoDB. It combines relational database with motivation and makes SQL so popular today. Okay, so let's see how this um, family factory or family production works. Everything is in JavaScript. So the AngularJS will help helping at the front end with the client, and the node uh, with the press were helping the server to do the server. And the MongoDB was working way back at the database, manage the database, more like a high storage, I would say. Um, so the AngularJS was send AJAX requests and getting JSON in the sky, and the servers will communicate with the database by JSON. And during this, it's very important that notice that no page refresh. No, you, you, need, you don't need to reload the entire page, which saves a great amount of time. And it's very efficient for you to know that you only refresh the page, the section you want to update, and not the whole page. And it's a very smooth experience. And why we, I'm calling it it's a family production? Because as I mentioned before, one language, and all, everything is JavaScript. You can, you can treat it as this is like their storage base. This is a production where they like, for example, <coughs> raise the calls, and the client is like selling the milks. This is a storage. Maybe you have too much milk in the cheese or in the storage. So that's basically how they work together, and it's very, very efficient, and hopefully can create very smooth user experience and fast loading time. To assume that Express is giving you a bunch of JavaScript functions, it's almost a language that sits on top of JavaScript. Uh, yeah, yeah, so Probably that's why no, it's it does the same thing. very convenient. And the cost of this, uh, of course, every project costs time and money, so that's why I have to evaluate them. And building this project, it roughly take me a time frame of eight weeks from start to end. And I want to host, after everything is built, I want to host on a cloud service. I'm thinking about choosing the Microsoft Azure. The, the lowest plan I, I see is $0.025 per hour. And if optional, we can get a domain, an awesome domain as well. Uh, the, the lowest price, price I can see is, uh, for the first year, it's like not one eighty nine, but the second year maybe it. But for this project, it would be fine. So that Azure price is if nobody if nobody uses it, that's the price. Yeah, yeah. Because so if the that's traffic a, goes up, you pay more, right? Yeah, yeah. Because this is a, the only the, the yeah. most basic one. But if you want more storage or the better service, you will pay more. Uh, I don't think that's for the current time being. It would be a large service. The lowest plan should be viable. And the tools mainly I would be using Atom for the. Text edit purpose for the JavaScript, also include HTML, CSS for the styling. And uh, I was using command prompt to run in a service, command prompt database, and also using uh, prompt dev tools to check the results and to take plug and test. There's also awesome Chrome extensions to help you to check your services. I was using those also tools as well. And uh, I'm going to break down the tasks. Um, of course, I uh, will start from the front end. Do the front end first, make sure it's good looking. And I want to establish the backend server to provide services. And after that, work on the database to make sure everything is stored. And everything is, once everything is done, I'm going to integrate together to check the, everything is communicating together, sending right data. I don't want users to lose their data, make sure everything is stored. Make sure they are safe, with secure authentication and authorization. And after that, I'm going to, after this local test, I'm going to test with the cloud server. I'm going to deploy to the Azure and everything work with the cloud. 
and then we, uh, we have the final product. So the milestones for this project will be, uh, so before I did the environment setup, which was for March 5th and 9th, after that was a spring break. <laughs> and last week, initial web design, so as you see the graph I draw before, that's the way I want to implement at the site. So it was last week, March 19th to 23rd. This week, uh, I'm implementing the uh, front development around March 26th, 30th. And last week, and uh, next week, I'm going to do the second and fix and do the back end, make sure the previous things is fine and going up. And the last next week after that is the April 9th to 30th. I'm going to build up the database, make sure everything is stored, have a place for them to store. And uh, <coughs> the week after is April 16th to 20th. I'm going to integrate test, make sure everything is working locally. And if there's no problem, I'm going to test with the online at 23rd and 7th. Make sure everything goes live first. And I'm going to do some couple uh, mod, um, modified or the uh, essential example users to check everything is working. If possible, I might send links to other people to get some feedbacks if I want this as a practice. Okay, so just giving some improvement for the time before the final project submit. Oh, and uh, the remark, the, I think for my final project, it, it is my first attempt to build the entire website from fresh with the main stack. They have a lot of convenient tools. I thanks for that. And uh, also, it's a great experience to have. And it's a good attempt. And I also, during the process, gain knowledge and experience towards future web development. I think whatever uh, career you want to do, it's always nice to have a, or either professional or personal websites to introduce other people of your work. So whether I'm not, I will, I will do this related job or not, I would like to develop my own personal website in the future. And I will having a more sense of the user-friendly interface in the future, whatever designing or software or the web, web websites. Or it's a portfolio project towards prospective recruiters or other people to your, to your past projects. And, and that's it for my project. Any One questions? Quick, go yeah. back to this, the, uh, uh, the task flow oh, diagram. Task flow. This one? Yeah. Uh, I would have thought it might be a little faster to. to uh, build the back end before you build the front end because that gives you something to test. If you build the front end first, you're going to have a lot of mocks. Yeah, they have just like to see what's the, happening. They have know? the empty ones now. Yeah, yeah, but if you build the back end first, then you can. I don't know, just a thought. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the idea for my front end is more rather than how I want to lay things out. But it's not not complete. I will have oh, okay. these empty okay. ones. Makes sense. But if once I build the uh, back end, I will have them hooked up and make sure gotcha. everything is working. Good. Any questions, Rajima? Any questions? Yeah. Uh, Rajima, you said I think everybody's going to be pretty busy this coming month. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Thiru Funke Chudun, and my topic today is our personal website using Mernstack and apps.net web, web API. So it's 
pretty similar to what he just talked about earlier, with just different technology. Let's move on and look at the, the outline. There are eight main points I would like to discuss. I will first talk about why I'm doing this project, and then I will talk about what Moonstack actually is, and why I used it for this project. Next, I'd like to cover tech stack and application architecture. After that, I'll give you an overview of F.NET Web API. Last but not least, uh, I'll walk you through F.NET Web API application architecture. And finally, uh, I would like to discuss about the performance between these two tech stacks, which are uh, Moonstack and F.NET Web API. Let's begin by why I'm doing this project before looking at Mernstack. Uh, I like to acquire new skills in modern web development technologies, especially uh, React, uh, because I would like to know more about React, which is the Java for JavaScript focused client web development. And I would like to compare the performance <coughs> between Node.js and AppsNet web, web API. And I think it's kind of like an instant portfolio because you can show this to your recruiter, yeah, and they can find it much more easily if you if you want if you want to show your projects or your passwords, the experience. <laughs> now turning to what Moonstack actually is, Moonstack is a combination of four open source technologies, which are MongoDB, Express, React, and Node.js, and what is the abbreviation of this technology? So basically, Moonstack is a technology stack that is made of JavaScript frameworks for building dynamic website from front end to back end. And you, that means JavaScript is everywhere. So there is only single language used for the whole stack. Now I will show you why I use Moonstack for this project. As I said earlier, it's JavaScript everywhere. So uh, when you write a the program for the whole stacks, you can, you can use only one language. And when using one stack, the object representation of this JSON in the database, in the application server, even on the client. So you don't have to worry about this that much. So you, you can use only one language. And it reduces your learning curve. Yeah. I assume everybody knows that JSON stands for uh, JavaScript Object Notation. Obvious. Okay, now turning to MongoDB. It's a very popular NoSQL and document-oriented database. It stores document as reason and has Mongoose library that uses for data modeling and manages connection to MongoDB database. I'm not going to talk much about it because he just talked about it earlier. So I will go through. Now I, sh I will show you why I use MongoDB. Uh, we don't have to think of our data in terms of row and columns of table like SQL. Also, we don't have to uh, convert um, or map the object that could deal with relational tables. Such translations are called object relation mapping, ORM, <coughs> and it's document oriented. Every document is in collection has unique identifier which it can be accessed because identifier is indexed automatically and is schemaless. So we start an object in MongoDB database does not have to follow the prescribed schema. And all documents in the collection need not to have the same set of fields. So, and the most, most importantly, is JavaScript based. So MongoDB language is JavaScript. So the good news, go back to that slide, the good news is that it's schemaless. The bad news is that it's schemaless. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my next point is Express. Uh, what is Express? Well, in a simple term, uh, Express contains a bunch of business logic uh, to check incoming HTTP requests and has helpers to make dealing with HTTP traffic easier. So the next slide indicates why I use Express. It is a web server built on Node.js, and it has helper, like I said, to make dealing with HTTP traffic easier. So, it has a matching specific <coughs> specific specification, which is a regular expression based, and it's very flexible. 
it passes request URL header and parameters for us. And when you want to wait for the response, uh, it has all the functionalities required by web application, including setting response, setting cookies, uh, and sending custom headers. Uh, let's move on and look at React. Uh, this is what I'm going to focus largely on. Okay, uh, one of the most painful tasks when developing such applications <coughs> is managing how the wheels uh, change in response to data change. But React team came up uh, with an algorithm that avoids unnecessary DOM pain. React is founded on the idea uh, that DOM manipulation is an expensive operation and should be minimized. A virtual DOM object is a representation of a DOM object like a lightweight copy. So manipulating the DOM is slow, whereas manipulating the virtual DOM is much faster. And because nothing gets drawn on the screen when you use a virtual DOM. Yeah. So by comparing the new virtual DOM uh, with a pre-updated version, React figure, figures out exactly uh, which virtual DOM objects have changed. And this process is called diffing, and I'm going to talk more about it in the next slide. So React solves this by giving the developer a virtual DOM to render <coughs> to instead of the actual DOM. It finds difference between um, the real DOM and virtual DOM and conducts the minimum number of DOM operations required to achieve the new state. So building a React app is all about components, and individual React components can be thought of as UI component of, uh, in the app. And it is created and maintained by Facebook engineers. Yeah. And it is highly efficient because of this virtual DOM idea. Yeah, and React is designed around the concept of reusable components. So you define small components, and you put them together to form bigger components. Uh, all components, small or big, are reusable, even across projects. So when the data changes, React conceptually uh, hit the refresh button and knows to only update the changed parts. Now, you will get to know JSX. Um, it is the syntax uh, in React. Yeah, so I use React because um, it organizes code into reusable components that can work together, like I said earlier. Yeah, um, it allows us to separate functionality into compartmentalize everything that we want to. And it has lifecycle maintenance, meaning uh, it modifies components based on state, event listener, simplify conditional rendering. Yeah. Uh, let's talk more about JSX. Uh, JSX allows you to mix HTML and JavaScript together, and it makes a React more readable. Yeah, like HTML and XML. Now, I would like to point out about um, React components. This is like the core of React because it's reusable. And it makes up the nodes included, included in the virtual DOM. So uh, it includes and maintains a state that changes with event. And each component maintains state independently. So if you want to pass the when component... you say it maintains the, space, the state, you're talking about the nodes in the virtual DOM? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but we have like a whole application state management level, but um, that's how Redux comes in. I'm going to talk about it later. Yeah, so uh, an application can be configured to respond to different component level events. Okay, now I will show you... Uh, the normal DOM first before we talking about a uh, React virtual DOM. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go to React virtual DOM first. Uh, so uh, it's kind of like node three that represents HTML elements, the attributes and content as objects and properties. So it selectively renders and re-renders subtree of nodes based on state changes, and it is very efficient because it does a little amount of DOM manipulation to update the components. Uh, to illustrate this, I have prepared a picture to show you how it works. Uh, let's see how normal, how normal DOM actually works. So when a node is updated, the browser will render all nodes, meaning change has been made to any given node. So when we re render all nodes to reflect the change, 
it times consuming yeah. so that's how we um, that's how face, uh, Facebook engineer created virtual DOM so uh, when a node is updated two things occur if uh, diffing is the process that React compares the new virtual DOM with a pre-updated version. So React figure out exactly uh, which virtual DOM objects have changed. Then the reconciliation process uh, identify nodes that are affected by the change. And we render only to uh, the nodes that were affected by the change. So, That's, so for example, when you say nodes that are affected by the change, if you change a parent and there's inheritance relationships with the children, then those are nodes that will be affected. Yes. Okay. Uh, to illustrate this, I have a picture on the next slide as well. Okay. But uh, so firstly, um, it identifies the nodes that have changed, and then it identifies the nodes that are affected by the change. So we call this one is the diff. It's an algorithm, and reconciliation is uh, another algorithm that can identify uh, the node that has been affected. Then it re-render only the nodes that were affected by the change. Okay, um, this is how it works. Uh, uh, like I said, uh, in your application, uh, it built or rebuilt the component tree, mark uh, dirty in virtual DOM when you, you have the node change. Then a virtual, a virtual DOM will run the different algorithm to compare the previous created component three with the new one, and does uh, the reconciliation algorithm, uh, and then uh, re-render the DOM node. So the, the actual idea DOM is node. you may have made a bunch of changes to the virtual DOM before anything happens to the the real, real one. DOM. Yes, exactly. Um, so uh, what is known, uh, in a simple term, no, it's just a JavaScript runtime used to execute outside of the browser and it has NPM to, to install programs and manage dependencies and it's it is written in C++. Yeah. Now I will show you why I use Node. Uh, it's a great platform for creating real-time apps because it's lightweight and very efficient. And the next slide indicates the relationship between Node.js and Express. So uh, Node and Express allows us to build server-side web app in JavaScript. We can get the data from the user via the URL query parameters or from, from the data. So Express are, is a library that runs in the Node runtime and it has helpers to make dealing with HTTP traffic easier. And in my project, uh, I'm going to use the middleware called Body Parser with Express. To illustrate this, uh, I have prepared a figure to show how it works on the next slide. So, when you're running your server <laughs> on your local machine, uh, your server is going to listen to uh, HTTP traffic on a single individual port. You can think of a port uh, being like a little door through uh, which traffic like HTTP re requests can be routed. So, we might have uh, some incoming requests uh, being issued uh, by, say, our browser also running on the local machine. Uh, it might take a request that might be coming uh, into some very specific port on local machine. So uh, I configure Node and Express uh, to listen to uh, the port of 5000. Uh, then Node.js is uh, going to see like going to see the HTTP request and then hand it off to Express. Then Express um, will read that request and decides uh, which route handler uh, so it should hand to. In this case uh, I have created uh, three route handlers. And the first one uh, the first route handler uh, has a responsibility to take care of a uh, very a very specific set of it. and another one do the same thing. In this case, uh, I take care of authentication system, um, the IUD operation, and the same for another route. Then, when the route handler process this, uh, it will send a response back 
to Node.js. Yeah, that's how it works. Okay, now I will show you a Redux. Um, so uh, Redux is normally associated with React specifically, right? That's right. Not used with anything else, it's just with React. Yeah, and I'm it, increases, guessing that's what I it increases a lot of performance. Yeah, okay, uh, now let's talk about Redux. Uh, Redux has a provider and store. So pro provider is a component that uh, makes the store accessible to every component in the app. Uh, there is one thing to be concerned, maybe use React. React uh, store the state in the, lab, in the component. So if you want to use that state globally, so you need to use the Redux, which is the, the library. So Redux library is all about holding all state where all the data mm -hmm. of our application. So it can store the whole state of our application. Now, the store hold the application state. It allows exit via the guest state and allow state to be updated yeah, via this patch action. It's important to know that you will only have a single store in Redux yeah, application. When you want to split your data handling logic, uh, you will use reducer comp composition instead of many stores. So go back to, so, so is the virtual DOM going to be stored in the Redo uh, store? Yes, because we, we keep the state. Okay. That's how we manage it. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show you in the next slide like, why. Like, as, because as your app like, grows more complex, you will want to split a reducing function uh, into separate function. So and each, uh, each reducer manage um, is like each part of your component. So the combine reducer helper function turns an object whose values are different reducing, uh, are different reducing functions into a single reducing function that you can pass it to create store. So for example, in this case, um, Redux store is where of uh, our state exits, right? So uh, we call an action creator which dispatches an action to determine our current state or to change our state. Yeah. So we have the combine reducer and each reducer uh, has each responsibility. So for example, like authentication reducer, we record whether or not the user is logged in. And project reducer, we record a list of all projects reducer user has created and block reducer, so we require a list of all block post user has created. So this slide looks like my last question that you answered yes is actually no. It's oh. not holding the... No, no, this one, no. this one, um, this one we like, we call like AJAX request or something yeah, else, but, like... but we keep the state in the Redux store. For example, like this looks like session management. Yes. Okay. Um, so the reducer are combined together with uh, the combined reducer call, and that is used to update the state in our Redux store. And we have actions. So actions are the payloads of inf information that send data from your application to your store. Yeah. So let's see the. Uh, we have React and React Dance workflow. So at the top, we have a React components, right? So we call an action creator. And then the action creator produce an action and pass it to the dispatch function. Now, uh, dispatch function is a function that belongs to the Redux store. So uh, it dispatch, the dispatch send the action to all different reducers that I just showed you earlier in the store and causing them to inst instantly recalculate recalculate the app state. So if we call the dispatch function with an action, the action will be automatically forwarded onto all different reducer inside the application. And combine reducer is the one who manages that. Yeah. So this reducer will produce a new value for the state and they will try to pass uh, all the state back to the store. That means it's update the state inside our Redux store. And then after that update, 
uh, all the state that exists in the Redux store will be sent back down to the React components, yeah, and causing them to re-render and display some amount of new contents on the screen. Yeah. So the next slide uh, indicates our uh, app user workflow. So uh, I'm going to talk about the app user app user flow walkthrough plus the tech stack. So at up top, uh, the user sign in via Google OAuth, right? Uh, so I use uh, Express Server, MongoDB, and Passport.js to take care of this. And then uh, user creates a new project, or new blog post, or new user profile. And user fill in a project form, a blog post form, or even a profile form. Then user can perform CRUD operation, like view, update, delete, yeah, on this. And Express Server and MongoDB and React Router will take care of this. I also use React Redux form for this as well. Now I like to point out the application architecture. So uh, I, ho I host my app uh, in Heroku. And React app and Express communicates entirely through HTTP or AJAX requests. So this is a JSON. Yeah, it's the data. And React will ask uh, Express API for some data. And then I use Express to take care of uh, HTTP <coughs> traffic. And it, uh, Express will pull some information out of the MongoDB and send that information back to the React side of our app. And I use Mongo, oh no, I'm sorry, Mongoose uh, to take care of it because it's a MongoDB library. And I host, uh, I use the production MongoDB, which is MLab. Yeah. You have to be careful of time where we got about oh, okay. seven or eight minutes, man. Uh, and now it's the app, ASP.NET Web API. Yeah, so it is a framework that makes it easy to build HTTP services. Uh, that reach a uh, broad <coughs> range of clients. Yeah. So uh, it's an idea platform that uh, for building RESTful application on the .NET framework. So many points web, API, uh, web APIs are based on model, values, and controller concepts. So I'm going to talk more about values controller in the next slide. Yeah, so the, con the values controller is derived from the controller-based class, which makes any class an MVC or web API controller. So this is an example like route API controller. It defines a routing strategy. So controllers are accessible based on this configuration. OK, um, let's test this. I have prepared a figure to show you. Uh, this is a value controller that provides the following methods that are accessible over HTTP. And these are HTTP verbs. Yeah, so I think you know all about this, like get, return, yeah. this, yeah. And this, uh, we, when we want to get a particular stuff, and this post, so when we uh, write something on our form field, we want to send it, yeah. What is the update, and delete, you just like remove that. Okay. So here is our app, app so, the web API system architecture. So the app.net web API, which is what you're talking about using, just for the class, uh, is not function oriented. It's uh, command oriented. Uh, so you know everything you see are in terms of those HTTP verbs. The, the whole processing structure around those HTTP. Which are hidden in if you go to conventional asp.net, not the not the web API, they're all hidden from you. Yeah. They're there, but they're hidden. Okay. So now uh, I'm gonna compare. This is how I'm going to compare the performance between uh, these two text stacks. So in terms of how many lines of code required, I'm gonna compare this uh, Node.js with uh, ASP.net Web API and the file size. Yeah. Um, the simplicity of the code and deployment. So if I use Node.js, uh, I can deploy uh, my web application 
uh, on Heroku, AWS, but uh, for F.NET uh, Web API, I might use like I might have to use only uh, Microsoft Azure or IIS or self-host. So I'm uh, we will see like in the pro presentation. So how difficult it's gonna be? Yeah, and is the cost read readability has a readability? And does a processing power required to run the application? Yeah. And how about the platform autonomy? Yeah. So this is what I'm going to uh, compare the performance. One really interesting comparison that you couldn't possibly do in this project. Uh, one of the major drivers, I would think, is security. Asp.net is built from the ground up to be very, very secure, and it's been pounded yes. on a lot, so they've got yes. a lot of the bugs out. Yeah. You know, you can't do SQL injection, you can't do cross sites, you know, tons of things yeah. That's that why you I'm trying can't to avoid do it. by default, <laughs> yeah. but uh, I believe the main stacks are all wide open for that. I don't know. So it, it, my guess is that when, when you design a website <laughs> with mean, Security is up to you. When you design it with Ask.net, security is mostly handled by Ask.net. No way you could compare it, but that would be a really interesting yeah, thing. Yeah, but that's tough yeah. one. Yeah, no, that's all right. All right, so here's our, um, my milestone. So I split into two parts. Um, this part is all about um, uh, primarily planning and research and discovery. So in early February, I did some research and refreshed my JavaScript ES6 skills. So I created a wireframe and tried to make a rapid prototype. Yeah, that was that happened in early February. Yeah, and in early March, I learned React and Redux and reviewed uh, the topics about state and props. Yeah, so I explore and. Try to understand the component basics, yeah. And late March, uh, I'm I was studying uh, AppStarnet Web API architecture, yeah. So I can like compare the performance. And this is what I have already implemented. Yeah. So uh, these are the technical development and coding. So I set up uh, the environment for these two and I install like the something that an environment is required for both technologies and I set up a Heroku developer <coughs> environment and production environment and I did some deployment checklist like setting up configuration variables and I created a, pro a project DB model and adding uh, some portfolios. Yeah, and I created a dynamic input form. So basically, like my schedule is like behind what I'm doing right now. Yeah, yeah. you're because learning a lot up front, and you're gonna work like hell at the end. Yeah, and yeah. so my my game plan is like in early April, uh, I'm gonna be restful API. <laughs> Restful API with apps.net, yeah, and try to enable grant operation, yeah, the apps.net web API, and then try to set up a Azure de uh, development environment and production environment. Then uh, I will deploy these two. Yeah. So your website is going to be fairly simple. Yes. I would assume it better be, or you won't get done. Because you're trying to do it in these two two tech stacks, two yeah. technology stacks, so, and it'll be really interesting to compare the code. You know, how easy is it to understand the code? How big is this code versus that code? No, and stuff like that. I think the most but, difficult part is um, learning this <laughs> two technology. Yeah, yeah. Oh. like learning could be so high. Yeah. Okay. Um, you might yeah. wanna. You might wanna uh, pick your priority. Focus mostly on your priority, and then you know either MainStack or Ask.net. It's MainStack actually. Yeah, MainStack actually. 
So uh, I'm the only one who implemented yeah, If you do these. equal effort on both, you're very likely to come to the end and you're not going to be done. If you focus more heavily on one, it's more likely that at least that one will be done and you'll have a little bit of comparison with the other. Yeah, but I'm almost be... done with like a Moonstack. Okay.